Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, our God, it is good indeed to declare your goodness, your greatness, your loving kindness, your faithfulness. Your mercies, O oh Lord God, are new every morning. And whatever burdens we bring to your house this morning, you are fully able to bear them. And if we are in your Son, you have a heart of love and compassion and faithfulness towards us. Oh Lord, we pray that we might know this. We pray that if we come with hearts lifted up and joyful, that we might remember that all our good is from you and that there is nothing that we enjoy, nothing of good that we experience that isn't from your hand and hasn't been given to us of right in the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, would you therefore direct our hearts and minds towards you this morning? Would you help us to delight in your character and in your goodness to us? We confess that we too often think much of ourselves, and we too often act in our own way. We sin against you, thinking our own thoughts, doing our own things, loving other things, ultimately in ways that rival you. And this, Lord God, is hateful in your sight, for you are goodness and light and perfection itself. O oh Lord, we pray that it would also be hateful in our sight. And we would name it for what it is, sin and rebellion against you, that you would give us the grace to turn from it and to look for cleansing and forgiveness in the blood of your Son. O oh Lord, we ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, please take your psalm books and turn in the back of them to the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on page 454. And here we confess uh, what we believe about our God, about his work in this world, about what he has done, about what he will do. So let us confess together these well-known words, but don't just let them roll off your tongue. Think about them and take them into your heart and uh, let them come out of your mouth from the conviction of your heart and mind. Let's stand together and confess what we believe. O oh Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Would the collection please be brought forward? Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our King, we bring to you these offerings, these tithes, and we pray, Lord God, that we would do so from 
hearts that love you. That we would recognize that this portion of what you have given to us is our token of love and servants unto you. In it, we declare that you are our king. In it, we declare that all our good is from you. In it, we recognize that we owe you love and service. O oh Lord, help us to give in this way, worshiping you. Lord, we also pray. There are many requests that we could bring before you this morning, but we think of this world and in particular the country of Russia. Lord, even in the last 24 hours, there's been great convulsions in that place. And we pray, first of all, for your people there, that you would protect them, that you would cause them to look to you in uncertainty, that you would even make them a beacon of hope and of calm and security amidst a volatile situation, and that people would be drawn to them and the hope that they have. We do pray, Lord God, for justice and righteousness to rule in that nation and that you would bring down rulers that oppose your ways and that you would set up rulers that love your law. Indeed, we pray for our own nation that where there are parties and rulers that are opposing your ways, killing the unborn, redefining marriage, undermining the family, limiting or seeking to limit the rights of your church, that you would convert or remove those who would oppose you, and that you would protect your church, that you would make her strong, looking unto you. Make us strong, O Lord God, that whatever happens, our hope and confidence might be in you, whether we endure hardship or whether we see outward victory in the conformity of our nation unto your ways. But Lord God, we pray, either way, make us more like your Son. Either way, cause your gospel to sound clearly and fulsomely from the pulpits of this land. Either way, convict and convert those whom you are calling to yourself and build up and strengthen your church. We pray also, Lord God, uh, for the efforts of our congregation, particularly as the rock comes over and joins us in evangelism. We pray even now that you would be preparing those whom you would have us to speak with to meet on the streets and that from that might come the fruit of people coming to church. Those who are now walking in darkness, seeing your light. We pray also, Lord God, for specific members of our congregation, and we pray that you would bring your comfort to our sister Yvonne, not only in the great pain that she is experiencing at the moment, but also as she loses a dear friend in Mary. O oh Lord, be unto her that, that friend which never goes away, which she is never separated from. O oh Lord, comfort her and strengthen her in her natural grief over this loss. And Lord, we pray that you continue to build up those who are healing. We think of our sister uh, Vera. We think of others, Lord God, who may be away from us because of illness at this time. Be with them as they worship in their homes and draw near to them. Make up to them the absence that they must endure from your people and your house. Oh Lord, we, we pray that you would strengthen us, and in particular, as we 
gather on the midweek, that you would equip us to speak of your gospel and that you would use us in prayer to strengthen, to build up, to further the work of your kingdom. And finally, Lord God, we pray for our presbytery. We ask that you would use the processes that you have caused to be in place for goodness and righteousness. We pray that truth might be seen. We pray that uh, where there are things that have been done wrong, that they would be repented of and corrected. If there are those who have been uh, slandered or wrongly accused, that you would also protect them. We pray that you would protect the unity of our denomination and that we might see a time where our focus would be away from some of these difficult issues brought about by sin and that we might be able to focus on the extension of your kingdom, church planting, the building up of our existing congregations and many other things to the glory of your name. All of this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of your church and our Savior and friend. Amen. Well, please take your psalters and turn with me to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, that's in Sing Psalms on page 38. And we're going to begin singing this psalm, uh, verses 1 to 5. Let us sing to God's praise. You'll notice that we finished in the psalm with this confession of David. Uh, He lays bare his sin to God, his guilt. Uh, He agrees with God about the truth of his situation. And we'll go on to see uh, how God responded to that. But before we do that, uh, we'll see how God responds to confession in 1 John chapter 1 and going on to uh, chapter 2, verse 2. So 
I'd like you to turn there, if you have a Bible, uh, to the letter of 1 John, and we'll begin reading in the first chapter. 1 John chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you take up your Psalter again? And we're going to continue now on in Psalm 32, picking back up in verse 6 and going on to the end and seeing the result of David's confession of sin.
Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in chapter 38. Let's ask God's help. Lord God, as we come to another chapter full of human sin, we pray that you would help us, that you would enable us to hear you speaking in it, and that we might take from it that spiritual food which you would have for us that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of you and in the practice and love of your ways. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's begin our reading in verse 1 of chapter 38 of Genesis. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived again, and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chezib when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Ernan, go in to your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his, and it came to pass when he went in to his brother's wife that he omitted on the ground lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brother's. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shares at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Julemite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Then he said, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then she gave them, then he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and lay aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, Let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. And it came to pass, about three months after that, that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, Bring her out, and let her be burned. When she was brought out, 
she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and the cord and staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give to her Shelah my son, and he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened as he drew his hand back that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterwards his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Confess your sins. Confess your sins. Those can be three challenging words to say, especially if you don't think you have any sins to confess. Challenging words to say, challenging words to hear. They humble us. They force us to put God at the center, which we sometimes don't do. And they're uncomfortable. But this is the call of this passage. The primary reason I say that is that the climactic moment of the passage is exactly that, a confession of sin. Verse 26, this is Judah speaking. She, as in Tamar, has been more righteous than I. She has been more righteous than I. In verses 1 to 11, we see Judah and his sons descending into sin. Those verses leave us with Tamar sinned against, forgotten, lied to, used in limbo. She's betrothed to a man she may never be allowed to marry. Then in verses 12 to 23, we see Tamar doing something about this and how Judah responds. But all of that is just the stage props for Judah's confession, what we just saw. She has been more righteous than I. They show how God used Tamar to bring conviction of sin to Judah's heart and confession of sin to Judah's lips. Finally, in verses 27 to 30, we see God's grace, God's grace in the form of another remarkable birth of twins. This grace of God in the form of these twins is given to Judah in response to his confession. So this passage is teaching us about the importance of confession to which God often responds in grace. But you might be wondering, you might be wondering, what about Tamar? What role does she play? You know, as we read this passage, we're immediately drawn to her. She is wrong, she's taken advantage of, she's vulnerable, she's a woman. We can sympathize with her, even if we think that maybe some of the things she did weren't quite right, we can sympathize with her. But the main character here is Judah. The chapter begins with him, the climax centers around him. He is the figure where we see the greatest change and and movement in character in the chapter. Tamar functions as a foil to Judah. What do I mean by foil? I'm not talking about the silvery stuff in your kitchen. I'm talking about its dramatic use, the dramatic use of this word. It's someone or something that takes another's or that makes another's good or bad qualities more noticeable someone or something that makes another's 
good or bad qualities more noticeable. Tamar makes the sins of Judah and his sons more noticeable. She is the human agent that God uses to move Judah to confess his own sin in part. She's also the means by which grace comes to him. Her action all focuses around his. Perhaps you're drawn to Tamar this morning. Well, let her draw you to be confronted by Judah. This story teaches us the importance of confession, confession to which God often responds in grace. And so my title this morning is Judah's Confession. And I have three simple points. Sin, confession, and grace. Sin, confession, and grace. In this passage, as it begins, there is a physical descent and a spiritual descent. The physical descent matches the condition of Judah and his sons. Verse 1, it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. This word for departed is more literally translated went down. And geographically, Hebron, where they were before, is much higher than Adullam. So he would have been going down physically. But more than that, the word translated visited is rarely used for just visiting a friend. It's normally used for turning aside from righteousness. His close friend, we're told, was a Canaanite, one of those people who were wicked, God-hating people, so much so that God was going to cast them out of the land in generations to come. The next thing we know, he's marrying a Canaanite, verse 2. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. Literally, Judah saw and he took her. You might remember that uh, combination all throughout Genesis. See and take is not a good combination. We saw it with Eve. We saw it with the sons of God and the daughters of man before the flood. As one commentator puts it, this phraseology is suggestive of a union based on chemistry rather than principle. Then out of this worldly union comes three sons. Two of them we know are bad, and we know very little about the last one except that he didn't do his duty. Years pass. Indeed, at this point, Judah, uh, sorry, Joseph in Egypt is almost about to be promoted to the equivalent of prime minister, and Judah, back in the land of Canaan, finds a wife for his firstborn, Ur. Her name is Tamar. Now, Ur is presented to us as a wicked man. He is wicked in the eyes of God, verse 7. And the type of Hebrew verb used here tells us that this was his settled pattern of life. He just didn't happen to do a few bad things. It was the way he lived. It was his pattern of life. So it says God killed him. The Lord killed him. Before he and Tamar had a chance to have any children, the Lord killed him. According to the custom of the day, Judah says to his next son, Ernan, you're to raise up an heir for your brother. That might seem odd to us, but actually it was quite humane and practical. It preserved a dead man's name, his legacy. It ensured the dead man's inheritance of property stayed within the family. And it ensured that the widow was taken care of. So Judah tells his second son to do this. 
Onan outwardly complies, but in such a way that he makes sure that no children come from this marriage. Why? Why would he do it? Well, there might be a variety of reasons, but part of it would be that he would get a bigger portion of the inheritance. If no children came from this uh, union, then he would get half of the inheritance rather than a third. More than that, though, this is something that is terrible. It is disrespectful to his father, it's disrespectful to his brother, it's disrespectful to Tamar, but ultimately to God, who had said to be fruitful and multiply. And God, it says, is incensed by this. Uh, we shouldn't think of that in a worldly sense of being incensed. God isn't like that. But in a, a settled, righteous way, he was angry about this action of Onan. And so God kills him too. Now there's one son left, and Judah's a bit nervous about what's going to happen to this one. Uh, son number one, gone. Son number two, gone. And so he's thinking, well, I, I can't give this woman to my third son. The same thing might happen. So he tells her to go back to her father, be a widow until he's of age. But he's saying to himself, I'm not going to actually give her to my third son because then I might not have a legacy at all. This puts Tamar into limbo. She is perpetually betrothed to someone she may never married. She's exiled from the family. So what we're seeing throughout this first part of the passage is a descent into sin, a descent into sin. And there's sin all over the place here. Think with me for just a moment about some of the sin that we see in this first part of the passage. We see selfishness. Judah is selfish by beginning by going away from the people of God for his own purposes. His sons are selfish in the way they seek their own ways. Onan in particular is selfish. He's greedy. All these men are insensitive. Judah abuses his authority over this woman, Tamar. He lies to her. He shirks the responsibility of giving his last son to her. He unreasonably blames her rather than his sons for their deaths. He lies to her. Onan is full of outward conformity to his father's command, but doesn't follow that up with actually following through on it. And then, of course, there is what we've seen as a theme in Genesis. There's worldliness. Judah begins all of this by going away from the people of God, going to live amongst the Canaanites, taking a Canaanite wife, and having his best friend amongst them. So there's sin all over the place in this passage. More than that, one sin leads to another. There's this descent into sin. So Judah's sin with Joseph perhaps was the reason why he needed to leave. It said at this time he left from his family and then he goes to being with these wicked Canaanites. Judah's sin leads his sons to sin, to more wickedness. His son's sin lead to their death. His own sin and his son's sin lead Judah to place Tamar in a terrible position. One sin leads to another. We see clearly that there's a descent into sin. But we also see here clearly that sin is not just something that is bad 
not just something that, that we think is bad or that society at large thinks is bad, but sin is something that is against what God says is good. You look there in verse seven, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. Verse 10, and the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Sin is not that which is socially unacceptable. Sin is not just what we think is wrong. Sin is not living up to or going against what God's law says is right. And finally, we're reminded here of the dire consequences of sin. It's put to us here in in quite a shocking way that Ur was wicked against the Lord and the Lord killed him. Onan did something that the Lord saw as wicked and he killed him. There's a sort of abruptness about that, but it's reminding us, like Paul does in Romans, that the wages of sin is death. That's where sin leads. So this first part of the chapter is showing us a descent into sin and some things about sin, that one sin leads to another, that God defines sin, and that sin has serious consequences. And what I want to exhort you to do this morning is to examine yourself. Examine yourself for the sin in your own life. We read earlier in 1 John that there is none of us, not one person in this room can say, I'm without sin. And therefore, as we see the sin in this passage, and these men going about their lives not examining themselves, we are exhorted to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves because sin traps in more sin. Examine ourselves because the consequences of sin is serious. It's physical death, but ultimately it is spiritual death forever and ever and ever under the wrath of God in hell. Now you might think that that is morbid, but this is what we're called to do as creatures of God who've been created by him, whether you're a Christian or not, and also as the people of God. We are to keep short accounts with God. We are to be examining ourselves for ways in which in thought, in word, in deed, we don't live up to his law or transgress against it. And would we be doing that daily, regularly? Are you? Are you regularly examining yourself to see the sin in your own life? The first thing we see in this passage is sin. But then the second thing we see is confession. The next portion of the narrative, verses 12 to 23, is even weirder if that's possible. It begins by setting the stage with a major change in situation. Judah becomes a widower, and Judah goes up to his sheep shears at Timnah. Now, Tamar is near there, and so she seizes on the opportunity. She seizes on the opportunity to become a mother, to raise up seed for her dead husband, to escape the limbo that she's in. I won't go into the details of what she does because of tender years here, but suffice it to say that she disguises herself as an immoral woman, she deceives Judah, and she becomes pregnant by him. She does all of that, but only after getting him to leave his staff, his cord, and his signet as a pledge of payment. And these were important symbols of authority of, of an important man in that time. Then, 
at verse 20, things start to shift unexpectedly for Judah. The, the ground, as it were, starts to shake under his feet. He's in a kind of spiritual earthquake. Because, first of all, he, does, he goes along with the plan, he thinks. He sends this goat to pay this woman, but his friend can't find her. So he has to call off the search in order not to be embarrassed. Then his daughter-in-law is accused of immorality, and he pronounces an absolutely horrific sentence, especially considering the unborn child. But when it's about to be enacted, she produces this cord, this signet, and this staff, identifying him, actually, as the person by which she has this child. It exposes Judah himself as culpable. It exposes him as a hypocrite. He was so quick to pronounce this horrific sentence on Tamar, yet the same thing ought to be pronounced on him. It exposes also his duty towards Tamar. That's what he says. She is more righteous than I because I should have given my son to her. Judah is, is humbled first by not being able to find her and then by this situation. Judah's hypocrisy is exposed and Judah's selfishness is exposed. More than that, he gets a taste of his own medicine. He is deceived with a garment and in a situation where there's a goat, just as he had deceived his father in the same way. And all of this leads up to his confession. She has been more righteous than I. She has been more righteous than I. I came across a helpful quote on what confession is this week as I was preparing. It's something that we talk about, but what exactly is it to confess our sins? Well, this quote says, Confess literally means to say the same thing. That is, to agree with someone else what someone else is saying, to agree with what someone else is saying. Therefore, the meaning of confess is to admit or agree. The meaning of confess is to admit or agree. Judah is agreeing with Tamar that he had not acted with righteousness. Judah is agreeing with God that he had not acted with righteousness. And this is actually a turning point in Judah's life. We've seen him so far as a brother full of anger. We've seen him as a murderous ringleader. We've seen him as a slave trader. But from here on out, in Genesis, he is going to be a man who increasingly is a man of compassion, a man who serves the Lord. And here is a turning point, this confession, him agreeing with Tamar and with God that he has sinned. Brothers and sisters, this is reminding us that where God convicts you and me, we too must agree with him. We too must be honest about our sin. Perhaps there are some elements in our lives that we're blissfully going along and not realizing that are against God's ways. Perhaps we are hardened in sin in various ways, like Judah was hardened in sin, and God convicts us of that. We are to agree with him, and we are to confess that. We're to do that in particular times of conviction, and we're also to do that regularly. Our confession actually has some very helpful information on this. In chapter 15, it says, as every man is bound to make private confession of his sin to God, praying for the pardon thereof, upon which and forsaking of them, he shall find mercy. 
So he that scandalizeth his brother or the church of Christ ought to be willing by private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those that are offended. It's saying we are to confess our sin to God, and if it's been against others, to them as well. If it's been public, we are to do it publicly. More than that, in that same chapter, it says men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. And repentance begins with confession. So we are also to confess our particular sins particularly. The picture that this is painting for us is not only examining ourselves to see where there's sin in our life, but being honest with ourselves, with others, and with God about that sin. Doing it in big things, doing it in public things, doing it in private things, doing it day by day, particularly in the particular things where we have sinned. We see here sin, we see here confession, but finally we see grace. And that is the hope which this passage holds out to us. It's held out here in shadowy form. But we see in the birth of these twins, grace. Now there is life where there was death. What have we heard about so far in this chapter? Death, two sons of Judah killed by God. Now we see life being brought into the world. They provide heirs for Judah. They replace the two sons that he had lost. And here, it's not just a random coincidence that these twins turn up here. This is God's provision. And I, I say that because there's certain similarities here between Jacob and Esau on their birth and this birth here. Follow me for just a moment. But we see here the younger supplanting the older. What does that remind you of? Jacob and Esau. We see here the color red in this scarlet cord. We saw red with Esau. Um, and so there's a certain deliberate coming together of these two things. The, the writer of Genesis under instrument, inspiration was trying to say that these two things are alike. Alike in, in God intervening. And so this new life is not just random, it's being provided by God. Finally, the birth of these twins points us to the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in one of these, Perez, is the line of Christ, the Messiah. God was providing the means by which the sins of Judah, of Tamar, and our sins might be cleansed and forgiven. The sins of all those who confess their sin and rest in Jesus Christ. That's why I read from 1 John earlier. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. He has turned away the wrath of God by his blood for the sin of those who confess their sin and rest upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The birth of these, two, of these twins point us to the grace of God. And it's in response to Judah's confession God is under no obligation to respond to confession with grace. 
You think of like Achan, as they were going in the line, he confessed and yet he was still condemned. But when that confession is married to a trusting on God and the forgiveness that he offers, he always responds in grace. So this morning, I want to exhort you to confess your sins. Confess your sins and seek the grace of God, which has provided the Lord Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his atoning death, his blood to cleanse you from sin. Confess and rest upon him. Confess and praise God. Praise God that you are not like Ur and Onan cast down in your sin. Praise him that he has provided a way for you to be cleansed and to receive grace. You may be a wicked sinner like Judah. You might be a wicked sinner, but be outwardly looking like a saint. But in either case, you need the grace of God. So, brothers, sisters, friends, examine yourself for sin, confess that sin to God, and seek God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, praising Him for a providing that for all those who confess their sins and rest on him. Let's pray. Lord God, we do praise you that we do not have to fear death in our sin. We do not have to fear being forever under your torment because you have provided grace for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we would confess our sin, examining ourselves, then being true with you about where we have failed and looking unto your grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if there are particular big sins in our lives, Help us to do this. Help us to do it each and every day that we might again receive and rest upon your Son in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you take your hymnals and turn with me to hymn number 500 and 39, hymn number 539, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Wretched, hymn number 539.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.